When you just have 30 minutes to go, you have to be very careful with your time, but I do want to make sure to mention a couple of things. First of all, if people could please silence their phones, uh, that would be a, uh, a big help. Um, second, um, you're welcome to stay for the entire day if you can, or just for this 30 minutes as you choose. Um, but if you do stay for the day, you will be hearing a lot about the dedications, because really we're, we're grateful to the people who have uh, stepped up to, to dedicate uh, each of the sessions today. Um, uh, first of all, to Serena and David Kashitsky for sponsoring the program as a whole in memory of Riva Kashitsky, Zechonel of Racha. And this session in particular is dedicated by Robbie and Brian Schwartz and family in memory of their dear great nephew, Ben Shaw, Zechonel of Racha. So our, our topic for the next 29 minutes and 12 seconds uh, is a chauffeur of cruelty. If you don't have the source sheets, they're in the back on the, uh, on the table. Um, I noted at the top of the source sheet the basic set of 30 blasts that we blow in each set of chauffeur blowing. We blow the chauffeur first before Musaf, then again during the Musaf Amidah, some do it in the silent one, some do it during the repetition, and then again we blow it at the end of Musaf. So you end up with each of the first two sets being 30 blasts, Tkiyah Shvarm Tkiyah times 3, Tkiyah Trua Tkiyah times 3, Tkiyah Shvarm Trua Tkiyah times 3. I'm not going to go through how we end up with each of those um, right now, because that's a longer discussion. But we do that set in the beginning, we do that set again in the repetition of the Amidah, that brings us to 60, and then after Musaf is over, we blow another set of 40. And the question is why? Meaning, we have the first set, and then we have the second set, and we have origins for, for both. In other words, the main thing is to do it with the blessings, with the brachot in the Musaf Amidah. That's actually the second set. And then we have reason for doing an early set before that that's beyond the scope of what we're going to discuss right now. But the last 40 don't seem to make sense at all. We should be done with the 60. It's unclear why we have that last 40 at the end. The, uh, but take a look, please, at source number three, and that's going to bring us towards an explanation of why we have that last set of 40, and that's going to lead us to our discussion about the shofar of cruelty. If you take a look at source number three, a passage from the Talmud, it's talking about how we blow the shofar, which sounds we make with the shofar. And one of the sounds that we make is the teruah. That's the staccato sound that we, uh, that we blow. Two, 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 two. And look at number three, please. The Talmud quotes you a biblical verse from Bamidbar, from the book of Numbers, which says, Yom Teruah Yelachem, that it will be a day of Teruah for you. Talking about Rosh Hashanah, it is a day of Teruah, which is translated into Aramaic, in the Aramaic commentary to the Torah, as it will be a, it will be a day of Yivavah for you. So I don't know what Teruah means. Teruah can be just a very loud sound. Teruah can be a cry. It can be something verbal. What is the Teruah actually? So the Talmud says, well, I have an Aramaic commentary that says, Teruah equals Yivava. And since we all know what Yivava is, now we know what Teruah is. Right? That was easy. Obviously not. So what exactly is Yivava? So the Talmud says, we have a story which we're going to come back to. It's from the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5 in which we are told about the mother of Sisera. Sisera is a Canaanite general. He is out at the battlefield. He has not yet come back. And through the window, the mother of Sisera gazed and vatiyavev. Same yivava sound. And there's a debate among the sages as to whether her cry as she worries about her son is, in fact, groaning, like the shvarim, the three elongated sounds, two, 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 or whether it's like that staccato sound that we call the truah, two, 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 and therefore we actually end up doing both. There's more to be said. I'm really crunching something. I shouldn't crunch, because, you know, again, we're, we're trying to sandwich a lot in. It's not the main focus of where we're going. But the message that, that we get here is that we learn the sound of the Shvarim or the Teruah from the sound made by the mother of Sisera as she worries about her son, the general, who is late coming back from the battlefield. that clear? Okay, I went a little quickly with that introduction, but hopefully that's, that's okay. All right. Then take a look at number four. Number four is a 10th century source. 
Rabbi Natan Baal Ha'aruch, he says, for those who are strict and blow 30 blasts while they're seated, and then 30 silently meaning during the Amidah, and 30 in order, the, um, and don't worry about the fact that 30, 30, 30 is 90, it's okay, parallel to the 100 cries of Sisra's mother, these 10 are when they complete the entire prayer, that's where you get your last 10. And others, Rabbi Nassim Baal Ha'aruch, writing in the 10th century, says, I am familiar with the practice of those who are strict, in which they end up with 100 blasts. 30, 30, and then 30 and 10 at the end. Now, he says that's those who are strict. However, every synagogue I've ever prayed in then has been strict. Because that seems to be the standard practice, to in fact blow 100 blasts. That practice that he mentions here of blowing 100 blasts is in fact associated with none other than the mother of Sisera. That when she cries, she cries 100 times. This Vatiyavev reflects 100 cries. And so too we blow 100 shofar blasts. That's the association which the sages, uh, which the sages make. Parallel to the 100 cries of Sisera's mother. And now I have a problem. Because what you're trying to tell me is that I have a core mitzvah, which is blow shofar. And I can satisfy that mitzvah with max 60 shofar blasts. However, what I'm actually going to do is blow 100 because Sisra's mother cried 100 times at, when, he, uh, when he was late coming back from the battlefield. I don't understand why we are modeling our shofar blowing on the mother of Canaanite general Sisera. Now, at this point, those who are not familiar with the story might say, well, why not? It's a mother. She's crying. Let me explain a little bit more about this story, and then I think you will understand the horror I experience at thinking about our chauffeur blasts on Rosh Hashanah being associated with this person. We mentioned already that Sisera himself is a Canaanite general. The Canaanites, remember, are traditionally the opposites of the Jews. Their story goes back before Jews first entered the land of Canaan, before Abraham and Sarah. Who is the original Canaanite? Who's the original Canaanite? Canaan, thank you. Whose main claim to fame in Tanakh is? Sorry? What did he do? He's the architect of the humiliation of his father when he is drunk. That's our main claim to fame for Canaan. His grandfather, um, his grandfather Noah, actually blames him for for what happens. That's our introduction to Canaan, and then you continue into the time of Abraham and Sarah. And Hashem says to Abraham, "Your descendants are going to get this land. You're going to get the land of Canaan, which becomes Israel." But not yet, because the Amorites, dwellers of Canaan, have not sinned quite enough yet. They're almost at the point where I want someone to get rid of them, and that's going to be your job, but they're not quite there yet. So they're bad, not quite bad enough for me to kick them out just yet. Then you move on to Rivka saying to Yitzchak, I don't want you to take a wife for my son from the Canaanites. You start to get a picture of who they are. Abram wants to bury Sarah, and he has to get a grave for her, and he faces extortion from Ephron of Echiti, who is a Canaanite. Yaakov and his family come back into the land, and they go to the city of Shechem, and Dina is kidnapped and raped by people of Canaan. Canaan is depicted in the book of Breshit, and then thenceforth in the Torah, as being people of grave immorality. So much so, that Hashem tells the Jews... When you come into the land, make sure you don't emulate Canaan. You want to know who you shouldn't be. Don't be like Canaan. He even says, we read it in the Torah portion, not this past Shabbat, but the Shabbat before. Hashem actually says the, uh, that you're not getting the land because you're wonderful. You're getting it because I need somebody to get rid of the Canaanites. 
that's the picture that we, that we develop here of the people of Canaan. And then, of course, they attack us in the Midbar, in the wilderness. They, uh, they attack us after the sin of the spies. They attack us after, uh, after the death of, uh, of Aaron. They are our opposites in what is depicted biblically as a cultural degeneracy. And they attack us when we descend and we become like them. That's your background on the people of Canaan. Parenthetically, the goal was supposed to be that we would enter the land and be spiritual role models. That's what was supposed to happen. And then they would see, wow, this is the behavior of people who are associated with God. We want to be like them. We would like to become Noahites. They accept the seven mitzvot. They become Gerei Toshav. That was what was supposed to happen. And of course, it didn't work out that way. That's a longer story. But that brings us to Shoftim Perak Dalet Perak Hey, Judges chapters 4 and 5. The Jews are living under oppression by Canaan. The Canaanites have chariots. They force the Jews to flee up into the mountains in central Israel. Devorah is a prophetess, and she is also a shofet, a leader. Shofet is more than just a judge. They were the leaders of the Jews of their day. She is told by God that it is time for us to rebel against Canaan. And Devorah instructs a man named Barak, who may or may not have been her husband, it's unclear within the story, to lead the Jews to war. He goes once she agrees that she's going to go with him. And the Canaanites come out to battle. The Canaanite chariots are routed with the aid of a flash flood. The Canaanim flee east towards their base to escape the Jewish attack. Sisera deserts. He flees southwest. He knows if he flees with his armies, he's going to get caught. So therefore he runs the other way, thinking that he'll survive that way. He runs to the tent of a man by the name of Hever, with whom he has an alliance. However, Hever is out. His wife Yael is home. Yael lures Sisera into the tent, pretending to be on his side. She puts him to sleep, and then she puts him to sleep. They, uh, she executes him. It's not really funny. They, um, but that's where we are in Shoftim chapter 4. So the Canaanites have been routed. The Jews are now free of the Canaanites. And then in chapter 5, we get Devorah's poem, which she composes in honor of and to commemorate the victory and its lessons. And at the end of the poem, you get what I brought you here in source number five. I'm reading the English as opposed to the Hebrew in the interests of time, but I brought you the uh, authentic Hebrew as well. At the window, the mother of Sisera gazed out, and Vatia Bev, that word that we used before as the origin of Yivava, crying. Vatia Bev, through the Eshnav. I'm going to come back to the word Eshnav, but call it a window for the moment. Why is his chariot delayed in coming? Why are the hoofbeats of his chariots late? The wise noble women answer her, and she also gives a statement to herself. She's comforting herself. Have they not found and distributed spoils? A womb, two wombs to every man. Spoils have dyed material for Sisera, spoils have dyed embroidery, dyed embroideries around the neck of the despoiler. That's her comfort for herself. It's okay. My son is fine. He's just busy stealing. He's busy raping. I get it. He'll come back to his mother eventually. So may all of your enemies, God, be destroyed, and those who love him shall be like the sun's emergence in its strength. That's the end of the section. Sisra's mother peers through this Eshnav. The word Eshnav is a very interesting word. Professor Eli Tzur, in the Dab Mikra edition of Shoftim, if you look at number six, offers an interesting explanation of the Eshnav and where it fits into the picture of what's going on in this story and in Devorah's song. He says Eshnav was actually something of luxury. If you lived in a fine palace like the Canaanite general, you had an Eshnav. Take a look. The tent of Yael, with its simple tools and objects, a stake and hammer, water and milk, is the opposite of Sisera's house in Haroshet Hagoyim, through the Ashnav window of which the lady of the house gazes surrounded by her matrons, their hearts given to frippery and made-up maids. In other words, it's luxury. Yael, 
has a hammer, she has water and milk, she has a steak, she puts them to good use, but they're, like, that's it, that's all that's there in the house. Whereas Sisera has this nice, beautiful house, everyone is nicely made up, and they have this luxurious window out of which Sisera's mother looks. It will be appropriate to note here that the Ashnab seems to be a layer of decorative stone in a window. It is one of the identifying signs of royal palaces and nobles as seen in archaeological finds in the palace of Ramad Rachel in South Jerusalem. So, what you're seeing with the Ashnav is a vision of luxury. Rabbi Yosef Albo in the Sefer Karim takes it a different route. He says the Ashnav is actually about sorcery, but that's its own, its own discussion. And she takes to heart the activities her son is involved in. Take a look at source number seven, top of the next side. Rabbi Levim and Gershom, Ralbag, Note something. And if you if you've learned Rabak, you know that the Rabak style of commentary is that he gives you little bits and pieces of comments through a story, and then at the end of the story, he gives you lessons you can learn from the preceding chapter, two chapters, three chapters, however much he considers a unit. So the eighth lesson he draws from this story is to publicize the disgrace of those nations and their wanton immorality. Thus, the mother of Sistra, in speaking of Sistra, began with what? Right? Not only is she consoling herself, my son is busy stealing and raping, but she puts rape first. That's her initial comfort for herself, that this is what the, her son is, uh, is engaged in. This is that opposition between the way the Torah presents Canaan and what the Jews are supposed to be, but it highlights for us the question. So why in the world are you modeling your chauffeur blast with which you appeal to God on the cries of this horrible, brutal human being? Like, like you, had, you had nobody else in Tanakh to work with? <laughs> like you just, we scraped the bottom of the barrel. This is it. All right, fine. Sister's mother it is. It's a boat sitting around in the, uh, you know, in, in the room somewhere by the sages. And, uh, and, and, you know, there were a couple of votes for this one. Eh, no, sister's mother. Yeah, I think that's what we should do. So... You know, normally, if we you know, were doing this in a longer form, I would ask you, and we'd make a discussion out of it, but obviously in the, the time frame that we're working with, I'm going to instead have to present uh, my ideas, but my email address is at the top of the source sheet. I am very open and would like to hear other ideas as well. So there are two classic approaches to this that say, let's shift the focus away from her villainy. Don't, don't look at that, sort of. Either by saying that we are invoking her to say, at least we're not her. It's a low bar. um, But at least we're not her. We're saying we are much better than her. She cried a hundred times in this horrible, brutal, terrible way. We're better than that. And it fits, actually, in the sense that the whole story in Shoftim chapters 4 and 5 is built to contrast the Jews with the Canaanites. I mentioned the luxury aspect of it, but also the fact that the women on the Jewish side of this story are Devorah, who's a prophetess and a leader, and, and, uh, and, and she pushes things forward, and you have Yael, who executes the enemy general, and then on the other hand, the women on the Canaanite side are sister's mother, Right? It's a very different type of a picture. So you could say, yes, that, that, that makes sense. It's part of a contrast between us and them. But again, do you really need to do that on Rosh Hashanah with the chauffeur? Like, that could have been done some other time. Second approach, also trying to shift the focus away from her villainy, is to say that we're supposed to look at her not as this cruel, horrible human being, but to look at her as a bereaved mother, or a mother who thinks that she is bereaved. And uh, Rabbi Aaron Goldscheider wrote a, uh, a remarkable essay on this on the OU website some time back. The, uh, and he, ta- he combines this with a medrash about, si- about Sarah, the, uh, who is also a bereaved mother, she thinks, that when Yitzhak is going to be killed at the, uh, at the Akedah. And so the idea is supposed to be to say, look, she's, at the end of the day, she's a bereaved mother. And that's a second way that you can, uh, that you can look at it. There are other approaches, some bring mystical ideas, some point out that the Talmud actually says that Rabbi Akiva descends from Sisera. But I'd like to give another thought. I think it's specifically because of her cold cruelty that we invoke Sisera's mother with the chauffeur. Meaning, I think, the mother of Sisera is herself the lesson. 
that even the most hardened and merciless human being cracks when it comes to what they care about most. In her case, it's her son. And we do the same thing on Rosh Hashanah. Even the person who has been cynical all year long, who has pushed away thoughts of what they've done wrong, who has pushed away thoughts perhaps of the people they've harmed, come Rosh Hashanah, the chauffeur is blown. At that point, they're supposed to crack. And I found a similar idea from Rabbi Yehuda Amital. He expressed it in at least two essays, one of Ocher B'Shirei Zimra and another one of Etaher Libenu of the Chavah Emet. They're both available online. He says, the goal of our prayer on Rosh Hashanah is to express ourselves sincerely from the depths of our heart. If you take a look at source number eight, you find a remarkable manuscript edition of Avot Rabbi Natan, which is cited in Rabbi Nachum Kasher's Torah Shalema. He describes Avram's face leading up to the Akedah, leading up to the binding of Yitzhak. At that moment, meaning at the moment when he's supposed to slaughter his son, at that moment the complexion of Avram's face changed. He said, I am old. He is young. Perhaps he could flee. And what would be with me? Let Yitzhak run away. You know, that's not the picture we usually have of the Akedah. Usually the picture of the Akedah is Avram is resolute, marching off to the mountain, and Yitzhak, once he realizes what's going on, is part of the picture and wants to have it happen as well. And this version in Avot Rabbi Natan says, no, 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 that's not actually what's going on. Actually, Avram is hoping that Yitzhak's going to run away. And Yitzhak says to him, Father, fear not. May it be God's will that the Revi'it of my blood be accepted. He says, may my korban be acceptable to God. A revi'it is a unit of a few ounces. The, uh, the Talmud states that's the minimum blood that one needs to survive. He says, I want that offering to be accepted. But bind me well, so that I will not need restraining. And when you go to my mother, Sarah, do not tell her suddenly, lest she harm herself. So you get this picture of Yitzhak being willing to go ahead with it and saying, tie me up and make sure that I'm going to be valid as an offering. But at that moment, Yitzhak consented verbally, but in his heart he was saying, who will save me from my father? I have no aid other than God, as Psalm says, my aid is from God, maker of heaven and earth. In other words, Abraham wants Yitzhak to live, and Yitzhak wants to live as well. They don't want to, uh, to, they don't want to die. They are appealing to God. And here's an interesting thing that Ravami Tal points out that I had never thought about until I saw him noted in his essay. One part of the slichot that is said over and over again in the run-up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then again on Yom Kippur itself, is a set of verses that start, each line starts with the words, Misha'ana, right? May the God who answered answer so-and-so. May the God who answered so-and-so answer us. Right? They, they, it's a, you know, a set of lines like that. And one of the lines is, May the one who answered Avraham at Harhamoria answer us as well. Right? He answered Avraham. How did he answer Avraham? By, not, by, by stopping him. So he shouldn't kill Yitzhak. Ravani Tal points out, though, Hashem never wanted the sacrifice. Right? It's key to that story that Hashem never wanted the sacrifice. From the beginning, He didn't want the sacrifice. So was He really answering Abraham at all? He was answering Himself. Hashem never wanted Yitzhak to get killed. If Yitzhak gets killed, the whole story ends. That's it. Right? We finish the Torah a lot more frequently, except we wouldn't be here to do it. The, um, like, what do you mean God answers Abraham at Har HaMoriah? He answered himself. So Rav Amital says the idea in that line is, the Anshe Knesset Hagadola, the authors of this prayer, are telling us that even had God wanted the sacrifice, God would have responded to the pure cry of Abraham and Yitzchak. Even had God wanted them to go ahead with it, he would not have gone ahead with it. He would have said, I can't do that. And he points out the Talmud Yerushalmi, which I brought you in source number 10, which says, we blow with the animal horn to say, God, consider us as though we were lowing like beasts before you. It's just a pure cry just of a person's pain, just of a person's anguish. There are no words to it. That's the way we appeal to God. I skipped number nine, in which Rav Amital says, I'm going to go back 
to it now. The early sages taught us a great principle here. Avraham was not a malach. Yitzchak was not a sarach. And then he goes through that line, may the one who answered and so on, which I'm going to skip now because we just said it, to where the paragraph starts, in truth. In truth, it was evident and known before the great assembly this was not only the realization of divine desire. Stopping the Akedah was not only about saying, I don't want the sacrifice to happen, but also a response to the human cry of our ancestor Abraham. Even had it not been the divine plan to refrain from sacrificing him as a burnt offering, Yitzchak would still have been rescued from the Akedah as a result of Abraham's prayer. As opposed to the passage of Sodom, where Abraham argued with God, the emphasis here is on Abraham's prayer. Had there not been a tradition teaching of such a prayer and the divine response to it, the sages would not have emphasized this. Abraham enacted the order of prayer of substance for that time and for generations. What he's trying to suggest here is that what wins the day at the Akedah is that cry for mercy. The simple cry for mercy. It's not, it's not elaborate. It's not an alphabetical acrostic. It's not you know, ornate and hard to understand poetry. Those who stick around until later on Sukkot, the prayer of Sukkot class that I'll be giving, they um, will do hard to understand poetry at that point. But this one is straightforward. This is the, that's what the shofar is about. And we choose Sisra's mother to say that even that hardened person can crack and express sincere emotion. Even as she does it in this repellent way, nonetheless, everybody can break through the cynicism. So we explained, well, we noted that we end up with 100 blasts. I didn't really explain all about the 30, 30, 30. We noted that we end up with 100 blasts. And we saw that link that we bring to Sisra's mother's cries for her son. She cries 100 times, and therefore we do. We develop the sound of the Truah and the Shvarim based on the word that describes her cry. We asked, why in the world would you do that, given her history, given her identity? We offered two standard answers. First of all, we contrast ourselves with her. We're not that bad. And two, that we look past her identity to say, but she's a bereaved mother. But I think we specifically use her to show that even the most hardened human being has a breaking point, And their cry at that moment, like the Akedah, is beautiful in its pure sincerity, as is ours when we come before God. And to me, that point is vital. Because when we approach Hashem on Rosh Hashanah, when we hear the shofar, the goal is not to have high-minded poetry. The goal is to get past the shell that surrounds our hearts. There are people who walk into shofar with all sorts of mystical intents in mind. And there are mazorim you can find with combinations of letters of God's name and so forth. And for those who can do it, that's great. But to me, that's not really the core of what we're trying to get to. We're not looking for, for technical ideas and high-minded thoughts. We live all year long in a very cold world in which people are uncomfortable with emotional intensity. And so people will joke and they'll schmooze, they'll do anything to, to break an intense moment. But at Chauffeur, we don't let that happen. We think about the people we love, about their needs, and that draws the truth out of our souls. And if Sister's mother can experience and express authentic emotion, so can we. May we do so and so earn a Ksiva Vachasimatova to be inscribed and sealed for a good year.